Supremacy? Yeah, do you even know what that is? Do you even know how to spell? Yeah, supremacy. S-U-P-R-E-N-C-S-Y. Supremacy. Do you know how to spell? Or are you just a bucula of truculent? Because I'm not the one. I know a lot more than probably what you do. I'm probably older than you. I'm very sophisticated and I'm highly talented. Spell it one more time for me. The core whites are whomever they are. That's why I say it's a mystery. Oh. They are, I put it in the textbook. The white supremacists of this planet are the most powerful people on the planet. And they are the most familiar mystery on the planet. What do I mean by familiar mystery? That's a term that I use in the textbook, meaning you are looking at them all the time, but you don't know who they are. That goes to show you how great they are at being magicians. They'll say, in fact, you have white people, and I've said at meetings where they have said it outright. Oh, I'm not really white. I'm part Indian. I'm part Cherokee. Like Cherokee is a color. Like Creek or Apache is a color. But they will say it with a straight face. And everybody will say, the black people who are present will say, oh, okay, all right, that's different. Rather than say, wait a minute. There's no such thing as part white. Wait a minute. There is no such thing, person, as part white. You're either white or you're not. So who are you, sir? Who are you, ma'am? Don't come to me with that part white. There's no such person as that. It doesn't exist. He or she does not exist. Now, are you trying to confuse me or what? Because there is no such person as what you're talking about. You cannot be part white. It's impossible. And are you saying, he said, well, I didn't say I, uh, that I was uh, part white. I, I said that I was part Cherokee Indian, but I'm a white man. More confusion. I know that. See, so in answer to what the gentleman is saying, he's saying he's still confused. You better believe you are. No, no, because no, no. I'm explaining to you how they do it. They will say anything, and you will wind up being the only person confused. I know black. So how do you tell who is white and who's not? You have to watch them very closely and see if they, under all circumstances, and that means you have to really watch that individual person, the way they move about in all nine areas of activity, and see if they can go anywhere and be accepted as white. That's the only criteria you can use in answer to your question. Because that's the only criteria I can use. I can say, oh, well, you know, Pedro Gonzalez, I know you say that you're a white man. Well, that's what you say, and you might believe that. Okay? But I will see how everything works for you or against you when you're around what I would call some sure enough white people. Yes, we need a code for everything. The white supremacists, if, if people will permit me to use that term, because I'm not going to move from it. I've had all kinds of suggestions down through the decades about, mm -hmm. stop saying white supremacy. And I'm going to say, no, I'm going to say it because it works. When you actually use it, it works. You may not think that it works, but it works. White people don't like that term even though they are the ones that gave it to me. I never heard this term, white supremacy, until I heard it from white people. They were bragging about the use of it. But I stick with what they're bragging about, because one thing, it's true, okay? Supreme just means a person can tell me what to do, and I don't know what to do about it, and I don't want to do it. But I still have to do it, because I don't know what to do about it. That's all supreme means. Okay, and if you base that on being white, and you are able to pull it off, then that's true. Now, 
I say in order to solve a problem, you first have to recognize it is a problem, even though the problem is more powerful than I am. I can't walk around in jail saying I'm not a prisoner because it makes me feel better. Many black people want to feel better instantly. That is natural. I fully understand that. But if you're a prisoner of war and you decide why you're a prisoner, you know what? I'm going to stop calling myself a prisoner. I'm going to say that I'm a king. I ain't no prisoner. I'm a king. And that warden, he's the prisoner. Look, he's on the other side of the bars. See? So he's, he's my prisoner. I got him in jail. That's why he's here. He's right here with me. And so that makes me feel better. Sure, that's a big temptation. But that doesn't motivate you to tear down in prison walls. See what I mean? Because that's what I'm trying to get to do. And that takes some courage. And that takes admission of the truth that we have been beaten. We're not just walking around doing whatever we want to do, the black people of this planet. We have already been beaten. But we need to get some adrenaline going to fight against the thing that has conquered us. Because it's what? Evil. And it needs to be replaced. We're not just trying to survive in this system. No. We are trying to dismantle the entire system. Or we should be. And any time that's not our objective, then we have no business doing anything. Well, according to what I've written in the code book, black people are not qualified to celebrate anything. Prisoners are not in a celebratory condition. Black people are prisoners of war. The non-white people of the planet in the system of white supremacy were born in captivity. We are still born in captivity, all of us. Everybody of color on the planet is born in captivity. Captivity to whom? To racist man and racist woman. The white supremacists of this planet. You're born inside of their prison because they dictate what you do in all nine areas of activity and what you do, don't do. Economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. They dictate this to all of the non-white people on the planet. Mm -hmm. And so you have to think, speak, and act according to what they allow you to do. So you are in prison. And so you're not, prisoners are not qualified. They can go ahead and do it, but you're not qualified to celebrate anything. But the white supremacists love for their prisoners to celebrate everything, including being in prison. <laughs> celebrate that. Yeah. Okay? Have fun. Get out there in the prison yard, and I mean, hey, just, just turn flips and sing and dance and play banjo. Slaves are always encouraged to mm -hmm. do this. Exactly. Entertain yourself. Mm -hmm. Entertain yourselves until you drop. Mm -hmm. but just be back on that job come Monday. Mm, yeah. All right? <laughs> now, some people have said they've seen some cartoons of my work uh, on the Internet that have been presented, and that uh, it, it pretty well embellishes what I have been trying to say in my textbooks. And uh, to the extent that it does that, well, that has been, from what I understand, some people reported to me a plus, because they didn't understand what I had written very well, but when they saw those cartoons that just repeated what I was saying and attaching my name to it and uh, came right out of the book, the material did, uh, they say that they better understood it. And I can understand that because people are kind of visual, particularly in the year 2021 now, uh, more visual than ever. I don't understand that. It just seems to me like how can you continue a battle that nothing, you know, that you had nothing to do with and 
you know, it, like you said, if it's been started like when, when uh, my buddy Josh's grandparents, it, it happened to them. But like I said, I, it, to my best knowledge, it never happened to us. We, we you know, grew up in the same place. You know, we, we you know, hung around the exact same people. We weren't treated any different than the white kids. And I just have a hard time with it now when I go home and see him that now all of a sudden he's, you know, you know, he's, he's, you know, he's a... I, you know, I, I don't even have a word, but... He's what? What, what, what is it he's doing? He's, he's saying just, something about racism? Yeah, and it, it, that it's, you know, it, it's... He's been, you know, it's been in his family for years, and, and, and so now he's got an attitude, even against some of the guys we hung out with when we were little, and, you know, he just brings it up, and it's, you know, like I said, until we were 17, 18 years old, it never happened to us, but he's m making it sound like he's got a... To, uh, you know, take over a fight that maybe his grandparents, you know, had a long time ago. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's look at your uh, associate, Josh. Uh, could, it, could it be that what he's saying, he's not making it up, and he's not talking about the past? Could it be possible that he's talking about something he's looking at right now, and that what he is saying is that he sees it, but that you don't? Could that, is that possible? Absolutely. Well, see, that could be the case. Now, it could be, like you said, that he's making it up, but I don't think he's making it up because I see it too, and I've always seen it. I've never been in a situation where I didn't see it. Now, if I was looking for it and it wasn't there, then that's something different, and I've heard people say that saying, well, I'm, look, I, I'm looking at the same thing that you're looking at, but I don't see what you see. And I say, yes, I know. <laughs> That's the treachery of the way racism works. And sometimes you can be looking at it, and I have this in the book that I wrote. In racial matters, many look, but few see. See what? See what they're looking at. You're looking at it, but you don't see it. Like an optical illusion. But if you're constantly looking for it, then, I mean, that's like they say. No, but looking... you can only see it if it's there. Otherwise, you are making it up, in which case nobody should do that. Well, that's what I'm saying. But you're telling me uh, just a second ago that you look for it. Well, if you're looking to, to see if something is racist, you're constantly, you, you know, you're, uh, you got blinders on. You're looking for it, and you'll take any little, you know, uh, section of uh, conflict or whatever and say, oh, that's racism. That's, that's not because of, you know, his bad attendance. That's racism. Because that's what you're looking for is what it sounds like. But I will only, but see, the thing that I claim, that when I do look for it, I see it. Because it is there. But it's not supposed to be there. That's the key. It's not supposed to be there. But you're looking. No matter how, much, no matter how hard I look, I'm not supposed to ever find it. Because it's not supposed to be there. It's, the racism should not exist. That's the whole point. Just like cancer should not exist. See, now, I can, I can look past cancer, you know. I can not recognize it deliberately, or I can recognize it deliberately, but I make up my mind that I'd rather not think about it, so therefore, if I don't think about it, and I'm not feeling the pain directly at that moment, because I'm laughing about something, like a cancer patient has laughed, but the cancer patient still has cancer. See what I mean? So racism is the same way. Black people laugh all the time. They're the laughingest people in the world, collectively. Nobody laughs like black people. In fact, there's more jokes made about laughing black people than anything else. Even in the old days, when it was right in your face, this thing called racism, black people laugh more then than they do now. Black people were, were the biggest jokesters because they were trying to hide the pain. That's why. But over a period of years, they laughed less and less as the pain began to go away because they were laughing at the pain. They were trying to laugh off the pain. And now a lot of us try to put on the blindness to not see what is causing a world problem. Now, a person can look at President Obama and say, he doesn't really have a problem, like President Obama said himself, said, I'm trying to get health care for the people that don't have it. See, I have health care. 
me and my whole family. I will never have to worry about health care. I will get top of the line health care. I already know that. He said, I'm trying to get it for the people that don't have it. I think he said, so if you're talking about me individually, he said, yes, I got health care. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm not supposed to be concerned about other people not having it. See what I mean? So racism is the same way. There are some people who say, well, I've been able to skirt it, and I've been able to get by, and I've been able to do this in the neighborhood that I was brought up in. I was able to shield myself from it. But see, the fact that you shield yourself from it means that it's there. And it shouldn't be there for you to shield yourself from it. I mean, that's the whole purpose, because when you try to move away, just like in the case of your friend Josh, when you try to reconnect with him, he's been hit by it, full force, and his behavior shows it. And that saddens you, but that's a fact. And the reason it's a fact is because he ran into it when he just moved just a little bit, and it hit him full force, really. It had him full force all the time. And that's when it's really painful. Um, so are you saying that you have never been mistreated because you're not white? Not that I know of. I mean, I've oh, had okay. things with you know, many people. And I mean, granted, there's always some bonehead, but that, you know, that, whether he's black or white, it doesn't matter to me. You know, I've come across, you know, boneheads, but I find my, myself finding more of my own, quote, brothers that would do me wrong more those more so than the white guys that I you know that I hang out with and I can and I can see why that would be because that's the thing that's the effect that racism has the very fact that when you interact with black people they are hostile toward you or they mistreat you and they they you know you don't get the kind of reaction that you should get from people when those people are black and there's a reason for that they've been affected by racism to the extent that nobody would want to be around them. And that makes sense because the system of racism itself produces black people that nobody wants to be around, including other black people. That is the effect of racism itself. That's not just something that happened because black people have this peculiarity about them that makes them into monsters and monstrosities. No, that's a system that does that. So black people, by the nature of being under the system of white supremacy, are made into creatures that nobody wants to be around, including the black people themselves. They don't want to be around each other and can hardly stand themselves. But since you got to be with yourself, it's nowhere else to go. I mean, if you are you, you are you. So what can you do? And so therefore, you turn that outwardly. Because there's nowhere else but to turn it inwardly, in which case you would be suicidal all the time. Which is what black people really are. But we just don't go that extra step. Black people are very suicidal because black people cannot stand themselves. They can't stand other black people and they can't stand themselves. Because when they look at other black people, they see themselves. And they can't stand what they see. Because we have already been made into creatures that are unworthy of being around anything. But the system did that. We weren't born like that. We were all born as little wide-eyed, curious children. But we were turned into monsters and monstrosities. I myself am a monstrosity. The very fact that I'm having this conversation in 2009 proves that I'm a monstrosity. What's a monstrosity? A monstrosity is a creature that is out of sync, out of balance. A person who is in the midst of a whole bunch of problems that can't be solved or apparently aren't being solved. That's a monstrosity. I'm one. Unfortunately, uh, me too. Uh, as long as the system of white supremacy. It's just a one answer to all three questions. In order to maintain the system of white supremacy. These are necessary things. 
cause confusion in what? All areas of activity. Because like I said earlier in this program, when a con- people are confused, they have to depend on people who are not confused. So the white supremacists use language to confuse people all the time, every day. You can't buy a car or buy a house without being confused. You, you can't do anything if you're a person of color anywhere in the world under the system of white supremacy without some kind of confusion being handed to, to you on a silver platter. See, the platter will be beautiful, the thing that they hand it to you in, but they keep that. And whatever was on that platter is loaded with poison, all right? And the poison is designed to do what? Confuse the mind. That's the kind of poison they put out. And they do it mostly by talking. That's why the people who are called in the Northwestern Hemisphere years ago, the people who are designated as called red people, people of color, by the white supremacists, those people said what about the white supremacists? They speak with forked tongue. Say one thing, mean another. If you listen to them, and they keep talking and whatnot, they will talk you out of house and home. They're expert talkers. Like, I sometimes call it Pocahontasism. And if they can't talk to one black person, they'll talk to another. They'll try to find the weakest one. Their record shows this. And this is not anything that Neely Fuller is saying, except I'm repeating what was taught to me. By whom? Directly and indirectly by people who believed in white supremacy. Many of them. I won't say all, but I'll say the most powerful and smartest ones. They taught me about what? The Indian maiden called Pocahontas. And say, you read this, boy, and you learn it what we did to people of color, you know, along with what we did to you. Read this. And even though you're reading it, and I'll tell you about it, I told you about your slave history because I got control of all the books. So, you know, you couldn't learn it any other way. I killed off the people who were actually, you know, the first ones. And so I inherited you. You are the illegitimate offspring. That's what the white supremacists tell us every day. You are my illegitimate offspring because I killed off your parents. I killed off the parents of all of the non-white people on the planet until they did what? Until their offspring learned my ways. But I will only teach them enough of my ways to Uh, their own detriment. I'll teach them how to fight each other and all of that. I won't teach them anything that makes them more powerful than me or as powerful as I am. Because I don't believe in justice. I believe in dominating and mistreating people. That's why I'm a white supremacist. Domination and mistreatment of people. That's what white supremacy means. It doesn't mean just, well, I'm trying to, you know, save myself as a white person, as a species and all like that. That's what they'll say. But see, no one was chasing them down, insisting that you give your woman to me. The white supremacists are doing that to other people, chasing other people all over the place and saying, give your women to me. I'll take them. And don't you touch mine, but I will take all of yours and run through every one of them that I can and produce offspring and then make slaves out of them and have them confused because I will always tell them that some of you are my offspring and get you to fight the other ones, the light skin against the dark skin and come up with all different kind of religions and have you fighting about that when I am the most powerful of all religions. There's no religion more powerful than the religion of white supremacy. Now, a lot of people will say, well, where'd you get that from, Fuller? I had to come up with that one because that's the truth. Compare any religion, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Judaism, Confucianism, Hinduism, with the religion of white supremacy, 
There's absolutely no comparison. There's never been a religion as powerful as the religion of white supremacy. Racism itself is an insane proposition. You know, what is racism? White supremacy. What is white supremacy? Mistreating people or treating people like they're criminals because of color. Also, you, you have, you know, people in very high positions who say that if you are a person with black skin, you are a toilet. So what do you do to a toilet? The little girl is a toilet, okay, in the minds of the white supremacists. This is universal. That's what a black person is. Uh, a, you know, a urinal. A toilet, you know, a commode bowl. That's what that is walking down the street toward you. If you're white, you're taught that. That is nothing. That is something to be disdained. That's something to have off to the side somewhere. Uh, a, a, a Jiffy John, I mean, you know, a, a, you know, a portable toilet hide, hidden over there in the trees. Hide that thing, I mean, you know. That toilet, I mean, that's not anything to, you know, that's not a shrine or anything. That's something that you hide. And, you know, even want people to see you going in there. All right? Okay. That's what these things that we have recognized, we call them in order to make them feel better. We call them people, but that's not what they really are. They are less than animals. Even the animals we bring out and parade in the streets and whatnot and show off. Okay, and we'll do a few of them like that, a few of our chosen ones. But basically, when you're looking at a black person, you are looking at a commode walking down the street. That's what that is. And what do you do to a commode? You treat it like it's a commode. End of story. See, black people have to see themselves the way that the white supremacists see us every day when they pass us on the street. Here comes a toilet. That's what that is, a walking toilet. And if I have to relieve myself, that's the thing that I'm going to do it in. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. Whew. Um, in those situations, what can we or what do we learn, you know, from that? Or, or how are we supposed to interpret that? Interpret it just the way I thought it, that I said it. See, I, I, when I walk down the street, I think that that's what they're thinking. Okay? But does <laughs> that make it true? Exactly what they're thinking. Okay. If they're white supremacists, I shouldn't even be in existence. I'm just something that you tolerate in existence. I shouldn't even exist. I shouldn't be walking down the street taking up the sidewalk. That's why sometimes... They walk almost walk right into you. I mean, you know, move. My goodness, I'm a white person. Get out of my way. You're not supposed to be on this planet, Negro. What are you doing breathing? Where did you come from? Who created you? Who would have the nerve to create something like you? I mean, who would make that kind of mistake? You're nothing but a walking mistake. My God, deliver me. But since you're here, I'll put up with you. But I ain't going to put up with you very much. That's it. That's the whole philosophy in the mind of a white supremacist. If we don't understand that, then we don't understand the world that we're in.
would say if if the black people are t- intended to replace white supremacy with justice, then they don't have it. They shouldn't have that fear, but they still might have it. But if they uh, believe that black people will not do the correct thing, if black, in, a, in other words, they believe that black people do not believe in justice themselves, then they have another option, and that is to kill all the black people, which they can do. Because uh, nobody's going to stop them, because nobody cares. Not even black people care if they tell the truth. Individual black people care, but generally speaking, black people don't really care what happens to black people, because black people kill each other every day in large numbers and think that it's fun. That's the truth. Because the white supremacists have programmed us that way. In fact, we think that it's cool, particularly black males. Killing black males is almost a rite of passage. As far back as I can remember, right up until this day, it's been passed on. That is a ingrained a part of black culture. It's more of a part of black culture than anything else. Black people killing and mistreating other black people is a part of black culture. If you want a definition for black culture, that's just about it. So the white supremacists have no problem with that. Because they will be killing us and we'll be killing each other. So if they wanted to annihilate us at all, it would be a piece of cake. It would be a piece of cake. But there's a problem with it. Over the period of time that the white supremacists have been in business, they have become accustomed to it. Now, accustomed to what? To practicing white supremacy. And what is the purpose of white supremacy now? According to logic, from at least my viewpoint, and studies and observations, it's white supremacy. They're not after land, they're not after money, they have all of that. The idea of white supremacy is a value within itself. That's what they're riding on now. Now, if they kill all of the black people, then they are no longer white supremacists. And then they will have no longer a reason for existence because they have made that their reason for existence. All of their movies, all of their folklore, everything that they do, every move that they make, proves that white supremacy is their reason for wanting to breathe, even wanting to get up in the morning. White people become lazy, really. When they are not, they don't have that adrenaline rush of practicing racism in one form or another. That's what keeps them going. That's what makes them get up real early before anybody else gets up. If they don't have that, they have no incentive hardly to do anything. Now this is based on evidence. Even when they talk about going into outer space, they are looking for people. What people? Well, their folklore tells us, look at Darth Vader, Darth Invader. Back in the 1930s, it was Flash Garden looking for the clay people. Clay people meaning people made out of mud. That was in the 1930s. So it's always this this thing, this driving force of racism. That's what keeps them going. That's their adrenaline. That's their cocaine. And if they can't have that, they don't see any point in being here. They've done everything else, all of the inventions, they could feed the whole world if they wanted to, with a snap of a finger. They don't want to do that. They like seeing people suffer, if the people are dark. They like to keep that pot stirred, they like to keep it going. They cannot deny this. In fact, they brag about it. Turn on any television set, that's what they're bragging about. They like to tear up things, build things up to tear them up. They know how to build things better than anybody. But they like death. They like to see things die. Even when they nurse everything back to health, and they know how to do that. They like to kill it all over again. It's a perversion of what the universe is supposed to be about. And that's why we are having this conversation, presumably, that we need a better
had a system. Got a wonderful planet here if we treat it correctly and treat each other correctly. But the white supremacists, as long as we have that doctrine, we won't be able to do anything to Listen. System of white supremacy. The system of white supremacy is a prison system. And the non-white people of this planet have been taken prisoner. So therefore, when a white person in the system of white supremacy has sexual intercourse with a non-white person, that is the same as a warden having sexual intercourse with a prisoner. It's also the same as a, quote, unclean mm. adult person having sexual intercourse with a child. Wow. Because the non-white people, the black people of this planet, in the system of white supremacy, have put, have been put into a childlike position mm. in every area of activity. We are childlike. Economics, we are childlike. Education, we are childlike. Entertainment, we are childlike. Politics. Religion. Why? Because we come under the authority of Big Mama and Big Daddy, who are the white supremacists of this world. Why? Because children are dependent on grown people. The wow. white supremacists are the grown people of this planet uh, Okay. in the system of white supremacy. And the victims of white supremacy, black people, brown no people, black. red people, are the children, Okay. the illegitimate children. That's true. Prisoners of war cannot be married. Look at it that way. I like to use the prison analogy because uh, a lot of black people have been in what we call prisons. Uh, the code calls it greater confinement. But we're all confined. We're all born in prison. And the name of the prison system is the system of white supremacy. So prisoners of war are not married. We can say we are. It has to be recognized by the prison masters. And uh, we, we just get together with someone and say that we are married, and the white supremacist says, yeah, but I'm, I officiate over all of you. See, if you're a prisoner of war, you can't make decisions or make promises to your so-called mate. See, when uh, a uh, say a married couple, for instance, has to have what? As an old saying, to raise a child, it takes a village. Well, it takes a system to support a marriage. So if you're in a prison system, you're really not married. You can call a person your wife, but a person, a lady can say, I have a husband. These are just words. But you can't promise that person anything as a prisoner of war. Why? Because you can't promise yourself anything. See, marriage is based on promises made and promises kept. But you can't guarantee anything if you're a person of color on this planet to anybody. Because you can't guarantee yourself that you'll even be breathing. If the white supremacists tell you when you're saying, I can't breathe, and the white supremacist says, yeah, I know you can't breathe because I got my arm locked around your neck. And if you die while I'm doing it, you're just a dead Negro, that's all. You're just a dead non-white person because I don't have to answer to anybody that looks like you, ever. I have to answer to other white people. That's what white supremacy means. So, to get back to the point, you're not married unless the white supremacists say that you are. And like the illustration you gave, black people on the slave ship say, I marry you, you know, you, you, you and me are going to be, you know, husband and wife. But you can't be a husband because you can't function as one. She's in chains and you're in chains by the chain masters. All right? So when you get where you're going, you say, well, wait a minute. Are you going to take her down? To, you, you, you're telling her to go here? That's my wife. We got married on the boat and all like that. And that captain of the boat says, 
hey, this is a slave woman. She's my slave. In fact, I had her last night, all right, when I called her up from the bottom of the ship before we landed, okay? So you don't have anything, Negro, African, whatever you want to call yourself, tribal leader. You're nothing to me. Neither is she. So I'm saying I'm selling her right now to this bidder here at the slave auction. And she's going down the river. You're going to stay here with me. End of story. So much for your so-called marriage. Now that has not changed. Because black people will say, well, yeah, I got a wife, but she's in California. But my job is up here in Minnesota. Uh, I got to do this. I got to do that. Say, well, how come she's not with you and whatnot? Well, I couldn't take her with me. Okay. Well, why couldn't her? I mean, our money wasn't good enough, you know, wasn't long enough. And I have to move around a lot, I mean, in order to make a living. She doesn't have a job, so I have to move a lot. And my job calls, uh, we can't have, you know, it's the type of job where you can't you can't have your woman with you all the time. Oh, according to whom? According to the people that run my job, and that is white black people's plight all over the world right now as we speak. There are black males by the millions who are working on jobs in places where a long ways from their village where they were born. And they're sending money back to what they call their family. They don't really have a family. Why? They're not together. They're not looking at each other. That's all in their imagination. They can't be with the person. They say, well, next year, you know, as soon as this job, I'm a migratory laborer, laborer, and I'm in this foreign place, but next year I'll be back with you all. I mean, send me some pictures, uh, you know, and show me who's doing what and how, how the children have grown and all like that. That hasn't changed. By the millions, dark people moving all over the world at the bidding of whom? Racist man and racist woman. That's why they are moving around. They can't stay where they are. Why can't they stay where they are? Because... The white supremacists have made it impossible for them to stay where they are and have anything. Mm -hmm. That's what white supremacy means. Mm -hmm. okay. So you don't have a wife. You don't have, you know, you don't have any, you can't claim your children as being your own. Uh, you have to send them to the slave master, to the captain of the ship, to get food and shelter, just like you have to get it if you're a person of color. Mm -hmm. That's the reality of white supremacy. Hey, yo, what's up, homie? Uh, why are you just sitting here looking up in the sky? Waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord. That's right, waiting on my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So you ain't gonna do nothing with your life but sit here and wait for Jesus to fall out the sky? That's right. All right. Then. Damn, so you still out here waiting, huh? Mm-hmm. So you don't mind if I go and take this watch and uh, the car keys? No. Jesus give me another one. All right, then. Cool. God have mercy upon us. <laughs> well, most white people don't even like to talk to black people because, you know, just on the conversation alone. Hmm. It's on that. You know, most white people cut you off real short. You know, they, 
They don't have time for no random conversation. They'll mention, you know, how the radar's going to do and something like that. That's about it. <laughs> they do not, you know, most white men, and it's certainly not white women, have conversation with black people, period. Because they know we ain't talking about nothing that they need to hear. <laughs> now, if they think that you are a thinker and that you are a doer, that you get things done, they'll come looking for you to talk to you. <laughs> but for the most part, they don't want to have no conversation. They sit next to you on the bus and whatnot. They, they haul out a newspaper. And then hide their face behind it so you don't even look at them, you know, and they don't definitely don't want to look at you. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I I have seen that. I have seen yeah. that. Yeah, I I um I, again as I said, I have seen this repeatedly, uh, and I encourage non white people to do that. In fact, um mm -hmm. a non white person asked me, uh, how would you go about talking to white people about racism? Uh and I told them, you know, you don't have to do that if you're a victim. Uh, you can just talk to them if you're trying to get a cheap plane ticket somewhere. White people should be able to help you out with that. If you're trying to get a mortgage or anything constructive, oh yeah, white and should... and and when you hear them talking to each other, listen, because in many cases they are handing out constructive information. You pick up on things that you don't hear otherwise, but you just about know what you're gonna hear from black people. Really? That's how the fuck we do it in the car, and y'all niggas next. Word of my mother, nigga. Black, nigga. Goddamn little homie. Goddamn little homie. Look at my face. Usually it's not very constructive. Wholeheartedly agree. Yes, you know, you pass by three black people standing on the corner, and you pass by them, and the conversation is really depressing. Hey, man, I told the MF, well, you know, I mean, I ain't no fool. I mean, he come up getting in my face. I told him he better, better not do that again. You know, that's what you hear, just in passing them mm -hmm. on the street. Yes, sir. Yeah, man, so, you know, he now he fooled around with that woman and coming over and bringing her over to my house. I mean, you know, they sitting down there, I mean, you know, they they eating my food. I told him, don't be coming back over there no more, you know. Yeah, I told him, you know. <laughs> How long have I been hearing that over and over again, year after year, decade after decade? The conversations are nothing but conflict or something depressing. I mean, just passing them. It's passing by the average black person. Just, just hanging out, I mean, you know, standing there holding a conversation. Now, you, you go another block, and there's two white men there having a conversation, wearing hard hats. I mean, they're probably, in, you know, construction supervisors or something like that. See? They're saying, yeah, Brian, now, uh, on, on, this, uh, <clears throat> on this deal that we got going over on... Uh, on uh, on on this 18th Street project, you know. Now, uh, are we going to need blueprints for that? See, this, you know, you're just passing by, but that's the kind of conversation you'll hear. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, yeah. I, I mean, I mean, you just pass. It's just a brief conversation, mm -hmm. you know. Or you got on the elevator with them, the freight elevator or something. I mean, and, you know, and that's what you hear on the freight elevator between two white men talking. Yeah, Brian, uh, so you come over and pick up the blueprints now, and that's on the 18th Street Project. See, and uh, we'll get started on that right away. We can do that, you know, in a couple of weeks if we should have it off and running, you know. Mm. Say, okay, I'll see you, you know. And then he gets off the... Mm. Then black people get on. Yeah, man, I told him if, you know. <laughs> I mean, he ain't the only one got a gun. You know, lots of people got guns, and I definitely got two or three of them. You know? You know, he come over there getting in my face again like he did last Thursday. I'll show him something. Mm. Then they get off the elevator. I mean, you know, I mean, two different worlds all together.
black people talk most, mostly to each other in order to, uh, to argue. That's really why they're talking. They don't know this, but that's why they're talking. They're not trying to learn nothing. They're not, you know, they're just trying to, like I said in the book, uh, show offism. They're trying to show how much they have learned from white people. But they're trying to show it to another black person because it doesn't make sense to show it to a white person. Because that's just who, that's just who told them. What do you think a black person is doing when they walk around waving their degree? I hear some black uh, professors and whatnot. I mean, stand up talking about, you know, how much they have learned, you know, and how degreed they are and all like that. And then turn right around and start talking about dumb white folks. And that's who gave them their degree. They came a long distance, some of them all the way from Nigeria someplace, trying to learn. Learn from who, me? No, they passed right by me. That's the one intelligence that they have. <laughs> How many black people? What, how many uh, black people do you see? And I'll go further than that. How many white people do you see following black people all over the world, trying to learn how to get to the moon? That's not where you go. Doesn't work. Anybody who will tell the truth know that don't work. I know some non-white people who would say there are white people who are not smart. Uh, I, in fact, just heard a whole them. lot of them, and they're correct. I'm going to join right in for you even uh, go that way. Yes, a whole lot of white people who don't know a whole lot of things. But you, you know what? Under the system of white supremacy, they know enough. Because they don't have to know. And what is that enough? Something I heard a white woman say one time. <laughs> a bunch of black people were, were laughing at her because they were laughing at the way that she dressed. Mm. He was talking about how tacky she was at the way that she dressed. This was on a job that I was on. Mm. They were getting on the elevator and they were just, they were cracking up at the way that she was dressed. Because she was dressed in what most people would say in an outlandish manner. This outlandish, okay? Like she had gone out of her way to attract a whole lot of laughter, okay? But she heard them laughing at her. And she turned around and said one thing. Yes, but I'm white. <laughs> and walked off. <laughs> wow. In other words, y'all can laugh at me and dress in all your fine clothes and all like that, but I can do things that you would never do in your entire life. I can wow. go places. I got connections that you would never have. No matter, your children would never have. That's what she was saying. That was back in the 60s. Those black people on that elevator got dead quiet. Wow. Because they knew that she was telling the truth. Say, yeah, I can dress in a cotton picking way I want to. <laughs> But you got no right to laugh at me. Because when you look at my overall circumstances and yours, no contest. <laughs> That's what she was wow. saying in just that one statement. Now, she didn't say all that. She just made one statement. But I was standing nearby. I knew exactly what it meant. <laughs> yeah, wow. but I'm white, you know. I don't have to dress no kind of way. I don't even have to have clothes on. I'm still in a league better than you. I got connections better than you'll ever have. Right. Wow. Yeah. So to all y'all on that elevator, I mean, just get on it, close the door, and go straight to the ghetto. The most ignorant about racism are the victims. Okay. This is why they haven't overcome it. Black people do not have racism as their priority. And, and when, wake up every morning thinking about how they're going to get rid of racism. The average black person on the planet wakes up in the morning thinking about what? 
Well, they may be thinking about a lot of things, but they're not thinking about getting rid of racism. And that's what exactly every black person on this planet should wake up in the morning thinking about and go to bed thinking about each mm-hmm. and every day with each and every breath that he or she takes. Mm-hmm. But we got every kind of nonsensical priority other than that. Okay. Yet we complain about our condition. And that is the reason we're in this condition, because we got every other kind of priority. Now, one of the main priorities among black people is what? Showing off. Showing off. Showing off to whom? Yes, you've mentioned Each that. Each other. Mm-hmm. Yes. If we tell the truth, that is our priority. Okay. Just trying to figure out a way to show off, even if showing off just means driving by and shooting at somebody. Yes. Yeah, That's off. showing off. Okay. But I've been saying, but, you know, people... People have a tendency to, you know, just, it's habit. That's what it is. You, you usually think the same way you've always thought. Even when somebody is telling you something different, you're really tuning it out and thinking the way you always thought, which is okay, because at some point you might choose to think differently or look at things a different way. I have been saying we are already a captured people. The war is still going on, by the way, because what is a war? It's nothing but conflict that, that continues. So as long as you have people resisting their captivity, the war is still going on. When people stop resisting, then that war is over. But the war between those who believe in racism and those who don't, so far, the victims of that war, the non-white people of this entire planet, have been prisoners of war. The white supremacists are not trying to capture black people. Black people are already captured and have been for generations. We are already prisoners of war. We are already in the prison called the entire planet because the white supremacists dominate every non-white person on this planet 24 hours a day in every area of activity. So we are already prisoners of that war. And so, therefore, we just keep asking the warden not to do this and not to do that, Black Lives Matter and all like that. They're not walking around saying, you know, you know, we matter. Uh, yes, they'll say it. I mean, in a joking fashion, but the white supremacists say it's, we're the only people that matter. I mean, you people are nothing but prisoners. And I do with what I want to with all of you, not some of you, all of you. It's none of you who are exempt from me who are exempt from my captivity. So, uh, but you try to break out the prison, you want to change the prison into some Garden of Eden or something like that, and you can attempt that, but I will continue to do what I do until I decide I'm not going to do it anymore. And that's the status where we are right now. That's Mm -hmm. the white supremacist voice talking. Look at what people like myself are doing Anybody who's talking about racism or talking about producing justice, heaven forbid, they are against it, but they will permit you to talk about it as long as what? Since they are very logical, very smart, as long as you are not effective. Okay. Now, when people listen to Neely Fuller talk, they just say, oh, yeah, that brother, he's okay. I mean, you know, and all like that. But and business as usual. They'll go right back doing the same things they've always done. You know, everybody does the same thing. We will continue what we call our traditional black culture, which is a failed culture, by the way. The evidence shows this. That's what black culture is. It's a failed culture. It hasn't solved our problems. Mm -hmm. You know, we hadn't added any new dimensions to it. It's still the same basic culture that we have always had. The white supremacists do not look at the speaker, when black people are speaking to other black people, the black people look at the reaction to the speaker. See, that's their pattern. That's right. their logic. Yes, sir. And it's, and it's the logic that makes sense. See what I mean? You know, you don't care what somebody says as long as nobody's changing, as long as nobody's doing anything different, just going through their same routine, celebrating the same things and all like that. Yes, sir. I mean, you know, looking forward to the same things. And so they just go out and take a look at what black people are doing out here slaughtering each other all over Southside Chicago, 
And they say, yeah. who cares about what Neely Fuller says? Anybody else? You know, black people still act the same. They don't change. They still want. How you figure that, man? Look around you, man. They own this shit. They own this couch you sitting on. Them shoes you got on your feet. This building. This school. This country. You. We're behind enemy lines, dog. One beat down and never compared to 439 years of captivity. Never. Oh, no shit. Fresh. That's the royal category. The royal uh, category based on color. You have all kinds of royalism, kings and queens and all like that. The system of white supremacy is a category based on color and non-color. And if you're in the in the color category, black, brown, red, yellow, beige, tan, etc., etc., then you are eligible to be dominated and mistreated by people who classify themselves as the non-color white. And I uh, <clears throat> kind of went in depth on that, but basically that's really what it's all about. It's just a form of mistreatment based on color. That's what white supremacy is. That's what I have in, in my book. And that's what I've been saying all down through the decades and whatnot. If you do not understand white supremacy, what it is, and how it works, everything else that you understand will only confuse you. Now, sometimes people say, well, you mean everything that I understand will confuse me if I don't understand racism? Yes, because racism is the dominant political and religious motivating force among the people of the planet in all nine areas of activity economics education entertainment labor law politics religion sex and war that covers just about everything that any person minute by minute might be doing or engaged in any time of day or night, anywhere on the planet. It's important to just understand all of the things that the white supremacists do. Because anything that you miss, that whatever you miss about the way they go about doing things, that's what's going to uh, eventually trip you up. They already know that. I mean, the system of white supremacy is very, very, very finely tuned. Like a smooth-running automobile engine. It's very fine-tuned. And they're always checking to see that that engine is running smoothly. If they hear any rattles or anything, I mean, they go and check on it immediately because it's not supposed to happen. I mean, they want a smooth operation. And the refinement stage of white supremacy means they do it so smoothly that the average black person, the average non-white person will say, white supremacy, that doesn't exist. Uh, what, what's that fool talking about? What are these stupid people talking about some... White supremacy. I do what I want to do. Mm -hmm. I go where I want to go. Nobody tell me what to do. You know, so then the white supremacy was to look at that black person and say, that's exactly the way we want all of them to think. That we don't even exist. Mm. That wow. everything, you know, that, that they're running everything. That black people run the world. That's the way we want them to think. That is the ultimate in the refinement stage of white supremacy. See, white supremacy goes through four stages. The first stage is establishment. I don't know when it was established. Some people say 600 years ago. Some people say 400 years. Some people say, no, 2,000 years. Then there are other people, depending on what scholar you talk to, say, oh no, 6,000 years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's when they really got established, 6,000 years ago. All right? That's a long time. Now, I say I don't know, but I do know that they are in business now, the biggest business on earth. No business is bigger than that, the system of white supremacy. Okay. So I'm saying 
I don't know when it's established, but it was established. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this conversation. That's one. Okay. Okay. And then the second stage is maintenance. Just like anything that you start, you want to maintain it. You want to go around, you know, if you put together a, uh, an aircraft or something like that, you come around and check. If you put together an air conditioning system or a plumbing system, you come and check it every now and then. See if it's running smoothly. Mm -hmm. That's what you call maintenance. Okay. Yeah, you, okay. You, you, yeah, you see that everything is in place. And then expansion is when you take in more people. The that, expansion. That's the third stage? Supremacy. And there's more people on the planet now than there was, say, 10,000 years ago or 200 years ago. More people on the planet. And most of them are non-white. So you're getting more and more people, you know, as your capital, you might say, in your business. You're getting taking in more and more slaves because they're being born. More people are being born all the time. Mm -hmm. And they're being yeah. born in your prison. All right? That makes your prison expand. All right? You make more room for them in your prison. Okay? And then the last stage, and this is the stage they want to stay in, refinement. You make your prison look like it's not a prison where the prisoners are concerned. Now you've got a smooth operation situation. Okay. All right. Where you have wow. people walking around saying, nobody tells me what to do. I'm my own man. I'm, I'm 21 years old. I'm grown. All right. I ain't no child. I mean, you know, I go and, I go and do what I please, when I please, when, you know, whatever I please. Mm -hmm. And have the uh, non-white females doing the same thing. Okay. That's a per per perfect situation for a prison master. Okay, let me get this straight. Establishment, maintenance, expansion, and refinement. Establishment, maintenance, expansion, and refinement. Okay. Now, they are trying to stay in the wow. refinement stage. Wow. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a lot of black people are saying, wait a minute. <laughs> We're in a system of racism. You can't fool me about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, hey, racism does exist. Okay. Racism is real. Racism is real. Now you got a whole lot of black people who are saying that now. Okay. Not all over the world. Not near as many as should be. Nowhere near as many. Okay. But you have a substantial number. All now, right. that disturbs the white supremacist business. Because in the refinement stage, you're not supposed to be aware that there is such a thing as racism. Correct, correct. All right. right, they're supposed to be so smooth, so they are arguing among themselves now, the white supremacists are. Mm -hmm. okay. And see, I mean, I told you to keep this thing in the refinement stage. Now you've got others that are saying, no, it's kind of getting out of hand. we got to start using the hammer and the fist. Mm. we got to start gunning them down mm. like we did in the old days. we got to right. be right in their face 24 hours a day. Okay. They said, yeah, that'll work for a little while, but all that'll do is stir them up. Yeah. You don't want to stir them up. You don't want to woke them up. Let these Negroes slip on. <laughs> don't woke them up. Let them slip on. Mm -hmm. All okay. right, keep oh. them asleep. That's okay. The refinement stage. Refinement. That way you can you can lay down and go to sleep, and they'll be waiting on you hand and foot, thinking that they're serving each other, mm. thinking that they're serving themselves. Mm -hmm. That's what you want—a smooth yeah. running machine. All right. There is a system of white supremacy which is racism, which is designed to do what dominate and mistreat people of color. Anybody who is classified as black, brown, red, yellow, tan, beige, has a little bit of color in his or her skin, or somebody said that they did, even if a person looks white, but they say that, well, you got a, you got a, you know, great, 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 great grandmother that had some color, all right? Oh, okay. Well, they're in the mistreatment category, right? Yep. Those are the people that you're supposed to mistreat because they got color in their skin. You know, if they got color in their skin, they're supposed to be mistreated. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, something is out of order if they're not being mistreated now. you got to mistreat those people that's got color in their skin. Well, uh, uh, why is that? You know, because I said so. Mm. Is that the reason? Yeah. That's all it took. That's all it took. Wow. And it's a lot of benefits that go with it. See? It's a lot of benefits that go with that. Mistreating mm -hmm. people based on color. Having a whole category of people. Black, brown, red, yellow, tan, beige. Just have some color in their skin. And you can do anything <laughs> you want to with that person. 
and nobody's supposed to say anything about it? Isn't that a wonderful proposition? Have somebody wait on you hand and foot, do whatever you say do, think the way you want them to think, on the kind of the color of their skin? Don't you think that that's a wonderful thing to have when you got millions of people like that right there at your beck and call? Ain't that wonderful? Yeah, well, that, yeah, but that, uh, you know, that, that sounds like that ain't right. Well, we're not talking about right and wrong now. We're talking about what's convenient. Oh, well, it is convenient. Well, then, that's all we need to think about, what's mm-hmm. convenient. Mm-hmm. All right? I mean, that's natural, that's normal. People like to do what's convenient, and racism is convenient for any person classified as white. All right? End of story. Period. And so the average white person takes a look at that and say, well, what if we didn't have racism? Then uh, that means you don't have a category of people that you can mistreat and get away with. Do anything you want to with. Use any kind of way you want to. Mm-hmm. Don't pay them. Don't pay them at all. I mean, you know, you're going to give that up? Give it up for what? What are you going to have if you give it up? Well, you got a point there. Yeah, I'll go with racism. So the average white person has every incentive to be a racist. I see. Okay. That's the bottom line that I want to, you know, get to. Get, mm-hmm. okay. Every white person, when given that kind of option, do you want the option of having people at your beck and call, people kissing your foot anytime you tell them to, and it ain't nothing they can do about it except kiss it? Isn't that a convenience? Well, you put it that way, it is. Hmm. Now, you want to give it up and just have to everybody equal, which means you're going to have to work harder. You ain't got nobody to push around. When you get mad, you don't have nobody that you can go over to cross town and kick or shoot mm-hmm. and whatnot. Mm-hmm. You just have to try to work it out. I mean, you don't have that convenience, you know. Well, yeah, I see your point. I see your point. Yes, I see your point. That's a wonderful point. Well, I know it ain't right, but it's convenient, like you say, and we'll worry about the right later. <laughs> I mean, you know. Okay. I mean, if ever. If ever. And that's all racism is, folks. Okay. That's all it is. It's a super convenience. You're if not- you're white. If you're not white as a person, if you're not classified as white, then you are something less than white. By less meaning you're supposed to have less power, less choices than a person who is classified as white in all nine areas of activity, wherever you are on the planet. It doesn't make any difference what shade of black you might be. Black, brown, red, yellow, beige, uh, uh, slang term, red bone, whatever. If The question is, are you white? Or not. That's it. You don't even have to go into the shades of color. Shades of color, just shades of color. White is non-color. That's why they call people of color colored people. People that have color. If you're white, white is not a color except when you're talking about paint. If you're talking about people, you're talking about a category of people who are supposed to be eligible to be white supremacists. That doesn't say, you know, a lot of white, uh, black people are white. If you look at their skin color, they're really white. We've got some of them in our families, extended families, if not in the immediate family, so-called. All right? Even though in in the system of white supremacists, there's no such thing as a black family anyway. I mean, that's a myth. That's something made up. That's something black people walk around thinking they got. Prisoners of war don't have families. All right? That's not logical. That's not true. You cannot be a prisoner of war and have anything. You don't even have yourself. Not to say anything about having a family. And the white supremacists prove that over and over again, all the time, right in our face. You don't have nothing. You have, you don't even have yourself. Mm -hmm. You just got me as your boss. That's all you got. And it'll stay that way. And that's what drives you black people crazy Mm -hmm. because you don't understand how we do that and what your status really is. 
That's why you are crazy like we have made you. And you act crazy. And you will be in this state as long as I have power over you. We mm-hmm. have to understand that. Prisoners of war. I keep saying that over and over again. Prisoners, what does a prisoner of war have? That's the question. A prisoner of war has nothing, even when they think they have something. Once you're a prisoner of war, you're just a number. Yes. And once you're a prisoner of war in the system of white supremacy, you're just a color. That's all that you have. And you don't even have that because the white supremacists would walk up to you and say what color you are, you know, on any given day. All right? Or what color anything is. If the white supremacists say, you look up a black person, you say, oh, the sky is blue. And the white supremacist said, no, the sky is gray. And the black person will say, well, I'm looking at it, and, and I can see, a, I know a blue sky. I ain't afraid. <coughs> mm-hmm. And the white supremacist will say, what do I say, boy? I say, the sky is gray. Now, you going to prove to me that the sky is blue? What are you going to use as proof? Well, uh, I got sense. I can see it. I, I can see that the sky is blue. I know blue when I see it. The sky is blue today. It ain't gray. And the white supremacist said, what did I just say to you? They say, well, are, are you going to make me say that the sky is blue? Now, that's the white supremacist talking to a black person mm-hmm. anywhere on this planet mm-hmm. right now. Are you going to make me say that when I just told you, boy, that the sky is gray? Yeah, but, yeah, but, nothing. Yeah, but, you don't overrule me under any circumstance. I don't care what you're looking at. You say you got a wife. I say you haven't. Your wife belongs to me. Now, prove that she doesn't. Because I can prove that she does because I own you. And that means what? And this is very important when the white supremacists are talking. If I own you, what do you own? Just answer that question. Mm -hmm. Stop and think about it. If somebody owns me, then what do I own? I don't own anything because whoever owns me owns everything that I claim is mine. And that gets back to that answer about somebody saying something <laughs> about a basketball player, uh-huh. uh, you know, having this and having that. Under the system of white supremacy, if you're black, you have absolutely nothing, not even a, a, the privilege of calling yourself black if a white supremacist say you're brown, like somebody just called in and said, or you're yellow, or you're blue. Why? Because I said so, boy. Because wow. I said so, gal. Now, you prove to me that I'm lying. And I just told you, you bet not tell me that I lied. Because mm-hmm. I can hurt you, and you cannot hurt me. That's the bottom line, folks. Yes, sir. That's the bottom line. I can hurt you a whole lot more than you can hurt me. And every non-white person on this planet that ever attempted to do that, we laugh at them. And we say, bring it on. Because now that's the bottom line. Can you prove it by force? Mm -hmm. Because that's what you're going to take to do it, to, to change what I just told you. Sky being gray instead of blue. Well, uh, one thing, when you set up a system where you decide what having it all means, okay, uh, the, the white supremacists set the value systems up for people all over the world. You know, uh, you you wear a suit and a tie, you're a businessman, all right? And, you know, and, and you can do business because they say this is the business suit. So even people who don't particularly care for the system of white supremacy, who are people of color, they say, well, hey, if you're going to do business, if you're going to be taken seriously, and the only way you can be taken seriously is that you wear a suit, whatever that means, what is a suit, and a tie. And what is a tie for? It's something you put, a piece of cloth that you put around your neck that kind of hangs down from your neck. 
and what what is that all about? Well, you got to have it if you're going to be taken seriously. Okay, according to whom? According to the white supremacists. I'm not sitting down and talking to you and you come in there, I mean, with your pants down and your shoes unlaced and, and your hair all over going in different directions and whatnot, and you're talking about you're a creature to be taken seriously. You are something to be shot because you look like an animal. Why? Because I say you look like an animal. That's why. All right? So it's the same way with what the value of a female is who wears dark skin. All right? What is that worth? That's not worth nothing to anybody. I mean, except to make some more animals to be used and mistreated. That's all that's good for. I mean, what she thinks or what her ambitions are or how she thinks she's supposed to look and all like that, who cares? Who is supposed to care? This is a throwaway creature. All it's good for is reproducing some more things for us as white supremacists to use for whatever we want to use for in the form of mistreatment. And when we get tired, in answer to the basic question, of just being in charge, just being supreme, we get bored. So we just check out. We kill ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because we ain't got nothing else to do, no way. I mean, you know, we, we know more than anybody. We can go any place at any time. Nobody stops us from doing anything. And so after we've eaten all the food and traveled here and traveled there, and we've sold people, we've told people that you come in and buy this little bag and you'll be somebody. Why? Why, if I buy this bag, I'll be somebody? Because I said so with your dumb self. You do what I say. What I say is the valuable is valuable. And I got a little bag here with my name on it, and that's valuable. And you should work for 50 years to try to get one of these bags. And then you can take it down and show it to your other dumb black people, all right? And they'll kill you for it. And that's a part of my business, too. And I'll put put my name on the side of some shoes that I make, and I'll get you killed for that. Because that's what I train you all to do, to worship whatever I give you and tell you that it's worth something, and you'll kill each other for it. And that's a part of my plan. Mm -hmm. But every now and then, I get tired of the whole thing. I mean, I do so much of it, I get sick of myself. So I just check out. So what? I mean, you know, because, hey, <laughs> you know, because I can. I'm a master. So if I decide that I don't want to breathe no more, I just stop breathing. So mm -hmm. what? You know, because I like death anyway. I mm -hmm. like the dead things. Mostly dead things in the form of black bodies. I like to see them dead. Neely Fuller, who wrote the uh, textbook for victims of racism, a number of years ago, in 19, in the late mid-70s, he used to say in a system, because he was the first person to talk about racism as a system, and he said that as the system of racism and white supremacy moves on, the system is going to have black men wearing dresses. Now, to hear that in the 70s, people said, oh, this is way out, and here we are. Do you see there's some black pediatricians who are saying we are developing epidemic levels of the effeminization of young black males. Well, I say the pants hanging it, sagging down is just a subconscious invitation for homosexuality. Do you see it's revealing the buttocks. See, so the pants are getting lower and lower and lower. The next step is to step out of the pants altogether. And so you step out of the pants, you're going to put on a dress. The effeminization is an essential ingredient of white genetic survival. And the only thing that can prevent it is black people becoming conscious or becoming determined that this is not going to happen to them because if the black men are destroyed, then the black people are gone, and we have a state of genocide.
in the last 500 years, black people in this area of the world, we can say that there's no such thing as black culture. What there is is what the system of racism, white supremacy, programs black people to do. You see, in other words, if the system of racism, white supremacy says, you are not going to be scientists. You are not going to be highly functioning doctors and lawyers and teachers. You are not going to have stable family life. You are not going to respect sex. Now, your role is to entertain me so you can jump up and down and sing, you can dance, and yes, you're good at sports. You can do that in some, in some venues. That's what I'm going to allow you to do. I'm not going to allow you to have stable communities because if you have a Tulsa, Oklahoma, I'm going to burn that down. If you think you're going to stabilize a so-called middle-class community and you're going to have a home that's mortgaged, I'm going to see that those mortgages are foreclosed so that you can be into family dissolution, place of living dis dissolved. So what we can say is that we have an imposed culture under the power dynamics of racism, white supremacy. See, I can see right now in my mind the picture of Beyonce with her legs wide open at the Super Bowl for last year. It was so appalling to me I can't get it out of my mind in terms of what has been done to us. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we would be wiser. No, we are trying to get ourselves to the point where we can establish what we would then call black culture. But we will no longer be victims of a system of racism and white supremacy. So once the re system of racism and white supremacy has been replace with a system of justice, that's when we will start talking about our culture. That's when we will begin talking about who we really are as black people. And so the white supremacists will run that through the computer. Well, yesterday we had uh, 18 classifications of sexuality that we're going to spread among the black people to improve their conditions. And you say, and okay, what's the projection for next year? Well, we got 18 now. Next year, the projection is 52. 52 different types of sexuality to choose from for you black people. And you say, well, why are you doing this, sir? Well, it's going to improve things for you. You black people want to be improved, don't you? All right. Well, get on board with this. Listen to me, all right? You, you need to diversify your sexuality. I mean, you know, you, it's something incorrect. Your sexuality is too limited. You talk about some male-female mess? I mean, you know, well, you need, you need to kind of branch out a little bit. I mean, you, all you ignorant black people all over the world talking about some male-female. I mean, are you crazy? Male with female? Are you crazy? No. Uh, well, sir, out of all due regard, what, uh, what, what should a male do? He's got a phallus, and the female has a vagina. Ah, oh, uh, well, I'll tell you what. The white anus is the new black vagina. How about that, boy? Wow. Sir, uh, what, what are you saying? Yeah, that's right. And the holy grail of all sexuality, as always... All you dumb, ignorant black people, the holy grail of all sexuality is what? The white female vagina. Black female vaginas are obsolete. Boy, have you heard? And you say, no, I haven't heard that, sir. Well, you just heard it now from me. And when I speak, 
That's God talking, right, boy? <laughs> yeah, okay. Let's do a little backslapping here. Let's do a little high five. Wow. You like that? Get on board, all you intellectual black people. We are going to disperse sexuality into thousands of different types of sexuality if we can get you to buy into it to get you away from what? That black male with that black female, that's what. Because right. eventually that's what we're going to have to keep doing. We're going to have to make it real uncomfortable for that black female to be around a black male at all and having these little black offspring forever that's making problems for us that we're getting to the place we can't govern. So we got to disperse your sexuality where you will trade in all your sexuality for some fancy bling bling around your neck and you got no phallus at all because I cut it out like I did back in the days when I used to hang you black people up on a tree and castrate you. Now I call it not castration, I call it sexual alteration. Don't wow. you want your sex wow. alterated, boy? Mm. You know? Yeah. Come on uh, in. Uh, I can I can alter your sex, and not only that, it's a bonus that goes with it. If you spread that word around the neighborhood, I'll give you good money. Mm. I'll put you in the movies. Alrighty. I'll put you on television. All right. I'll give you a spot. Racism itself is an insane proposition. You know, what is racism? White supremacy. What is white supremacy? Mistreating people or treating people like they're criminals because of color. Also, you you have, you know, people in very high positions who say that if you are a person with black skin, you are a toilet. So what do you do to a toilet? The little girl is a toilet, okay, in the minds of the white supremacists. This is universal. That's what a black person is. Uh, a, you know, a urinal, a toilet, you know, a commode bowl. That's what that is walking down the street toward you. If you're white, you're taught that. That is nothing. That is something to be disdained. That's something to have off to the side somewhere. Uh, 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 Jiffy John, I mean, you know, uh, uh, you know, a portable toilet hide, hidden over there in the trees. Hide that thing, I mean, you know, that toilet. I mean, that's not anything to, you know, that's not a shrine or anything. That's something that you hide. You know, even want people to see you going in there. All right? Okay. That's what these things that we have recognized, we call them, in order to make them feel better, we call them people, but that's not what they really are. They are less than animals. Even the animals we bring out and parade in the streets and whatnot and show off, okay? And we'll do a few of them like that, a few of our chosen ones. But basically, when you're looking at a black person, you are looking at a commode walking down the street. That's what that is. And what do you do to a commode? You treat it like it's a commode. End of story. See, black people have to see themselves the way that the white supremacists see us every day when they pass us on the street. Here comes a toilet. That's what that is, a walking toilet. And if I have to relieve myself, that's the thing that I'm going to do it in. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. Whew. Woo. Um, in those situations, what can we or what do we learn, you know, from that? Or, or how are we supposed to interpret that? Interpret it just the way I saw it. I said it. See, I, I, when I walk down the street, I think that that's what they're thinking. Okay? But does <laughs> that make it true? Exactly what they're thinking. Okay. If they're white supremacists, I shouldn't even be in existence. I'm just something that you tolerate in existence. I shouldn't even exist. I shouldn't be walking down the street taking up the sidewalk. That's why sometimes they walk almost walk right into you. I mean, you know, move. My goodness, I'm a white person. Get out of my way. You're not supposed to be on this planet. 
Negro. What are you doing breathing? Where'd you come from? Who created you? Who would have the nerve to create something like you? I mean, who would make that kind of mistake? You're nothing but a walking mistake. My God, deliver me. But since you're here, I'll put up with you. But I ain't going to put up with you very much. That's it. That's the whole philosophy in the mind of a white supremacist. If we don't understand that, then we don't understand the world that we're in. Listen. And when you're subject to a system where the system is designed to be insulted, and that's the system of racism, and all non-white people are subject to that system, that's my uh, evaluation, then you can expect to be insulted each and every day, either directly or indirectly, even when you don't think you're being insulted, even when the insulting language is not used. You're still being insulted by being subject to an insulting system because the system of racism is insulting and that's the only system that we have ever known and when i say we i mean the people who are classified as non-white the white supremacists and they are that's the correct title for them of this planet are the dominant political and religious force and economic force if you want to use the term economics, I don't use it within that context, but they are the dominant people on the planet when it comes to non-white people. So non-white people can expect. We shouldn't get jolted when we insulted or call names, anything like that. Uh, you, you can't, you can't, there's no way to pretty it up anyway. And when people do try to pretty up an incorrect system, then they are going more into the realm of illusion. And that is going to engender more frustration, confusion, and ultimately disappointment and anger. Because you can't walk around trying to evade reality. We're in a racist system. We are not in any other system. Racism is not something that people encounter every now and then. We are in a racist system. The entire system is racist. There's no part of the system that is not racist. In every area of activity, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. Now what does that mean? It means that the people who have chosen to be racist, meaning white supremacists, have become the most powerful political and religious people on the planet when it comes to non-white people. People who are classified as black, brown, red, yellow, tan, beige, etc., etc. And so, therefore, that's an insult in system. And so black people have gotten to the place, particularly in the modern times, since what we call the post-chattel slavery. Black people expect to be respected. That's why black people kill each other, many of them. Many of the younger black people more than anybody. About this thing called dissing, or being disrespected. You're in a disrespectful system and all the killing that black people do among each other all the time saying you're disrespecting me therefore i have to kill you so that you won't disrespect me anymore and then you run right into the same thing again and again and again how many bodies can you stack up because you are being disrespected in a disrespectful system if you're classified as black you're not supposed to be respected you're on a slave ship. The entire planet is a slave ship. It's not called that, but that's basically what it is. And the destination of that ship is just its own destination, meaning subjugation to the system of racism. There's no black person anywhere on the planet who is not subject to the system of racism. So 
you wake up in the morning, go through the day, and go to bed that night, and all through the night while you're asleep, you're being disrespected. You're being insulted because you have been put into a prison based on your color. That is one of the biggest insults, not only that a person can receive, but it's really a slap in the face and an attempted insult to the creator of the universe. But the white supremacists don't care about that. They don't mind insulting the creator of the universe. They'll say, I don't like your creation. You made all these black, brown, red, and yellow people and put them among me. I'm supposed to have the planet to myself. And since they're here, though, I will insult them and I will kick them around. Your product, even though I am your product, I don't want to be bothered with these other products that you made. So actually, they are not only at war with the black people of this planet, they are at war with their creator and with ours. Unless I've been misinformed. The white supremacists, they manufacture hatred because you have to do that. And you have, if you're going to dominate people, dominate people and then mistreat them based on that domination and say that you, these people are eligible. You, you do admit that the people are, are really people, but you say they are a breed of people who are eligible to be mistreated. So you have to teach that to your offspring systematically over a period of time. You drum that into their heads over and over again, and you even drum that into the heads of the people that you're going to mistreat. You teach them, look, look at yourself in the mirror. You are nothing. You are nothing. You are nothing. You are something to be despised. Anything that looks like you, including your mother and your father and your neighbors, if it looks like you and it's moving around on this planet, you should despise it. Why? Because it is worthy of being despised. Why? Because it is dark. That's why. And anything in the form of a person that has dark skin should be despised. Say amen, boy. Say amen, girl, behind what I just told you. Anything that looks like it might be, just might be, in the form of a person, but that person has dark skin, the darker the more that person or that thing that looks like a person is supposed to be despised. And by it being despised, you let it exist, but you let it exist with the understanding that it's supposed to be, supposed to be mistreated. If you tell it to do something and it doesn't do it and it begins to run away from you, you shoot it. It's a it. It's a thing. It's even something that you can't even describe as being on the level of a dog. Because after all, I mean, you know, a dog does have some type of proportionate something that you can value. But this thing in the form of a person that you call a black person, you don't know what that is. Except it's something you're supposed to if you are classified as white, and even if you are classified as black, you are su supposed to despise that thing and not only express it in words every now and then, not so much in the modern days, but you certainly express it in your actions toward it. Put it last on your list of things that are supposed to be given any kind of constructive consideration. And this is the society that we're in, worldwide. And that's another thing. Stop talking about in the Northwestern Hemisphere. This is worldwide, always has been. White supremacy is everywhere. There's no place you can go where it doesn't reign supreme. That's what it means by supreme. That's everywhere, in every area of activity. Economics, 
They control it. If there's any people of color calling themselves having some kind of economic system that's not subject to the white supremacists, you're fooling yourself. Education. They hoard all the knowledge and have you come to them to get it. To have it set up like that. And they tell you how much of it you can get. And not only that, if you're a person of color, they tell you what you can use it for and what you better not use it for. And they got the muscle to back it up. And then that's economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. And if you have color in your skin, they dominate your movements in all of these areas of activity. Truth be told. Supremacy? Yeah, do you even know what that is? Do you even know how to spell? Yeah, supremacy. S-U-P-R-E-N-C-S-Y. Supremacy. Do you know how to spell? Or are you just a bucula of truculent? Because I'm not the one. I know a lot more than probably what you do. I'm probably older than you. I'm very sophisticated and I'm highly talented. Spell it one more time for me. We're not thinking about what's coming at us at all because most people don't even have an idea that such a thing as white supremacy exists. When it controls everything, if you're black, everything that you're doing the white supremacists control. Even when you think that you're controlling something, the average black person wakes up in the morning and say, well, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. Well, you're going to do this, and you're going to do that on whose terms? I mean, when you walk out your door and the street that you walk on, who determines what street that you're going to be on? Even when you walk out what you call your door, because your door might not even be your door. Your door may be something that you owe somebody for. Have you thought of that? You hmm. say, this is my door. This is my house. Is hmm. it really? Hmm. When you stop to think, who really owns your house? Are you beholden to anybody? I mean, is this a house that you built on the street that you built in the place that you decided it would be? Or did was the place already there and somebody told you it might be a good idea for you to go over there and take a look and then move in move in on what on whose terms on your terms not likely on somebody else's terms and who is that somebody else ultimately who is it have you ever asked have you ever thought about it do you really control your existence on this planet you're the average black person, particularly black males, you know, we got this thing about, you know, physicality. If I take off my shirt and I got big bulging muscles, I mean, somehow that's a cure-all for everything in the world. I'm a black male and I got strong muscles. I can lift weights and I can run down the street faster than anybody else and get where I'm going. Uh, that's somehow makes me a strong black man and that's all I need I got these bulging muscles I'm, I'm fit and I'm trim I love to take my shirt off particularly you know in the summertime and whatnot I don't want to wear a shirt at all I take my shirt off so people can see my strong muscles okay and I can lift things I can go here and I can go there but have you ever stopped to think about what you can use your muscles for or against and what's the product hmm. is this all that you have do you have anything else to show for your being on this planet up to now do you have a plan for the future hmm. that goes beyond just you taking up the sidewalk making people walk around you when you come down the sidewalk because you're in the middle and they have to go past you, the latest with the baby strollers and all like that, because you are, hey, your own man, or are you really a man? 
because the people who, when Martin Luther King was assassinated, there were a lot of strong males, strong black males, but I, I tend to believe they were people who understood their position in the system of white supremacy. That's why they had signs. Now, these are people that lift garbage pails. you got to be strong to do that. But they had signs saying what? I am a man. People right now can go to their computers and punch up the day that Martin Luther King was assassinated, April 1968. And there in Memphis, Tennessee, Martin Luther King was there to tell, to help the garbage workers, who were all black, I understand, to get higher wages. And these garbage workers, these sanitation workers, proud people, people who, uh, many of them, I mean, were, you might call it that day, uh, pillars of the community and in the church and all like that. But they were sanitation workers. But they were also saying, yeah, even though we're sanitation workers, we should be getting a decent wage. But they didn't have signs saying we should be getting a decent wage. They had signs saying almost in unison. There are photographs of it. That's a historical record saying what? I am a man. M-A-N. Like Muddy Waters even had a song saying, man, man, you know. Right. Over and over again. And when black people, and they don't say it so much nowadays, they say dude, but black people used to use the word man all the time back in the 40s and 50s. That's Why? Right. You had to keep saying that to kind of reassure yourself that that's what you should be. You should be treated like a man, you know. I'm a man. I mean, don't be calling me no boy. I'm a man. You say, boy this and boy that. I'm tired of hearing that, you know. I mean, even when black people would say it to each other, hey, boy, you know, hey, well, you know, man, uh, hey, I'm a man. I'm three times seven. That was a common saying. Three times seven. That makes me 21, you know. I'm a man. And if you don't believe I'm a man, I'll prove it to you. you know? Meaning I will do harm to you physically. That's what it meant in the old days. But see, black people had to keep saying that to each other. And finally, they had to start saying it to white people. But the white supremacists said, it's only going to be one man on this planet. And you boys who want to be men, I tell you what, after Martin Luther King is dead, I'll make a deal with you. Hmm. You'll go from boys, you'll go from boys not to men. You'll go from boys to women. To women. Yes, I will degenderize you and get you to love it. You will love acting like your sisters and love being that way and go around looking for another male to do things with you in the bed like you're a female. Oh, yes, but see, you have to codify your approach to any black person. And, and that is, for one thing, you can't get in an argument with black people, period. I mean, we got to stop arguing. The minute the argument stops, or starts, according to the code, then you say, I will talk to you some other time. You know, a brother or sister or whomever you're talking to, and, and you always have something else to do once the argument starts. All right, do, do not feed that argument, because that's going to... Black people, we go at each other. We do not do togetherness very well at all. We have to admit that. Because we have been loaded with poison, and all of us have been affected by that poison. This is important to remember. I mean super over-the-top important. We all carry poison. It, it, it varies in degrees in different parts of the world. But Rwanda shows it. Uh, every neighborhood where you find black people clustered together. Uh -huh. It, it, it is pure poison all over that place. I mean, you name it. It's poison. I mean, and we cannot even speak to each other for 15 minutes without that poison coming to the surface. Yes, sir. Thick all in the northwestern hemisphere. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hear people outside my window on a Saturday night, and I've heard it all of my existence on this planet. And sometimes just talking on the phone. People just passing by the building. All right? And what do I hear? 
I can recognize sometimes what we call a black voice, and it's practically screaming and yelling. Every type of curse word that you can possibly think of in the English language, and most likely, for sure, for sure, talking to another black person, because that's how we communicate, and talking about what we are going to kick when I see you next time. All right? You, 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 you better not be there when, when I get there. I mean, you can believe that. You, now, you be there when I get there, because I'm on my way over there right now. And I, I, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you what I'm going to do. I'm tired of telling you. Now, that's the kind of conversations you hear. Mm -hmm. You hear just walking down a sidewalk. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are some kind of loaded with hostility, like mm -hmm. you wouldn't believe. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can feel it, and you can get around ten, ten black people, and you can almost feel it coming. But when we're joking around, it's hostile. Hostility, hostility. Now, every now and then, we'll kind of, you know, have a facade of kind of breaking that up into a whole bunch of high fives and hugs, which is 99% phony. All right, because right behind it is going to be the pop of the nine millimeter. That is, that is our Bible. And if not that, some type of uh, dagger uh, recently been using a lot of knives because uh, gunplay gets into gets you deeper into trouble with the white supremacists. All right, we know we got the answer to the white supremacists even when we slaughter each other. I don't care whether it's in the Congo or Rwanda, or South Central, or South Side Chicago, or Washington, D.C., anywhere, okay, where you have black people, you have that built-in hostility. Man, I'll kill you. Don't you know I'll kill you? Don't you understand that i kill you? You keep on running your mouth. I'll kill you. I can kill you. Yeah. And uh, I'll settle with the consequences later. To prove that I'm a man. Yeah. We are, particularly mm -hmm. all the black males are mm -hmm. a growing number of black females who are trying to be males because they'll find out that they have to be just to survive. Mm -hmm. Almost, act like the males, dress like them, talk like them, get that swag, all of it. You can't be a man in the system of white supremacy. That's absolutely impossible. Mm -hmm. Not Neely Fuller, not a college professor, not anybody. It's no such thing as a black man in the system of white supremacy. So, Being an old boy, I mean, you know, hmm. talking about our elders or whatnot. Uh -huh. They're just old boys. Old boy. They are in the system of white supremacy. Let the white supremacists come around <laughs> and see how quick they become, go from man to boy. <laughs> yeah. uh, how, hey, I don't take no stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah? You don't take no stuff? <laughs> I mean, when the white supremacists come around, you don't take no stuff? Yeah. I mean, you can't survive without them. They let you breathe, mister. Stop lying to yourself and stop trying to prove it to the boys in the hood. Yeah. Because when, when boss man show up or boss woman, okay, because, oh, yeah, you can push the white woman around when ain't nobody looking. <laughs> but the white supremacists get on, get on your tail. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're going to be, yes, master, mm -hmm. no master, hmm. maybe so, Buana. <laughs> Give me, cut me a little slack, Bonner. <laughs> Don't send me back to the prison again. Mm -hmm. Don't lynch me again. Don't do this again and again and again like you did my grandmama. Oh, no. See, all the facade, all of the nonsense goes out the window when master comes around. Yeah. Every black professor, every black <laughs> guy hanging out on the street yes, selling sir. drugs, we all know this. Our biggest problem is we keep lying to ourselves about how powerful we are and how great we are because we built the pyramids. <laughs> that won't go get you not one dime worth of nothing in 2019. That sent black people that, hey, we let that fella get that seat to show that, you know, we're pretty nice people, basically. But that little demonstration was just that, a demonstration. We don't intend for that to take root. You know, we don't intend for you people to get any ideas 
that racism is not the basis for what we believe in. Because it is. It's the only thing that we believe in because it's the only workable, most successful government, the government of racism, that has lasted so long and run in an efficient manner. Now, we will, you know, tip our hats to you people every now and then and let you find a little opening here where you can demonstrate to us that we have done a pretty good job of raising you. But don't get carried away. Don't think that you are qualified to tell white people what to do, because you're not. Because we taught you, you didn't teach us. Fella, just shut up. What did he keep telling the empty chair? Shut up. Yes. You know, don't say anything else. You talk too much anyway. You've had your say. We've let you come. We've let you warm the seat. We've let you drive around, ride around in limousines to get the feel of it, know how it's like. You can go out and tell all your other people, black people, all your little picking in it, what life is like in the White House and whatnot. Now, get back to the plantation where you belong. We have always given our Negroes watermelon day out of one year on the plantation. We used to do that. Let all the people from the slave shacks come up and throw watermelon rinds all over the tailored lawns of the big house. It would be, we're just going to extend it a little further because one thing, we want to do a whole bunch of damage, mainly put hits on people, mostly black people, on his watch so that history will record. What, what was that black president known for? Well, he really didn't do anything about money. He didn't, he didn't hardly have any competence about getting anything done, but he helped us to kill a lot of people. That would be the record. I think that's the aim of the white supremacists for Mr. Obama's record. Oh, yeah, well, now, when it came to putting hits on people, in fact, we can always use them to do some droning now, you know. Hey, if you want to be a successful black person, we got some droning we want you to do. We got some people we think ought to be dead, so we don't want to have a record of killing people ourselves all the time. We want black people to be known to be excellent hit men. So a non-white person, they say, well, you know, Mr. Uh, excuse me, President Obama, he is clearly a non-white person. Uh, there is a white person who is working at Wendy's, making minimum wage, struggling. You are not going to tell me that President Obama is inferior to that white person, that President Obama is uh, less than that white person working at Wendy's. What would you say to that? I would say he's still under the system of white supremacy and is the white supremacist, according to Mr. Obama himself, he wouldn't have that job. You're saying if it was not for the white people who practice racism, white supremacy, Mr. President Obama would not be in the White House? If, if any black person who forgets that is getting a very, forgetting a very important fundamental, he couldn't even been running. His name would have been not been known. He wouldn't have had a white mother in Kansas who could teach him anything if the white supremacists had not agreed to that. See, I'm talking about white supremacy, thinking about it in depth, not just on the surface. There are a lot of black people just think he just walked in there and say, "Hey, I'm a black. I'm a president. I'm I'm going to be president." And I'm going to be president because I want to be president, and it don't make no difference what you white people think. You walk in there like that. What you gonna do? What you gonna do? He's campaigning. He said, I'm asking you all to help me. And white people came out in Springfield, Illinois, by the thousands, and took a look at him. And said, you know what? I think I give this boy a chance. Mm. to go through the training that we have given him, you know. Because, you know, and like Mr. Obama himself said, you know, in four years you can snatch me out of here anyway. They can snatch him out of there before four years. Mm. Yeah, they can, they can, they, he can give up that seat tomorrow if the white people decide, hey, that's right. <laughs> He'll walk right in there, right in the middle of all them papers that are stacked up on his desk. And he's trying to solve problems and all like that. And they walk right in there and they tell him, hey, just like the mafioso, 
the organized crime, which is what white supremacy is. They just walk in and say, hey, you know, we made a decision this morning. You out of here. We got a janitor's job for you, Union Station. <laughs> And that's where he will be. He came to work at 9, at 10. He's down there putting on his janitor's cap and drawing his equipment out of the storage room for buffing floors. First black president. Photograph of it. You know how Mr. Obama looks. Yes, sir. He can look the same way, smiling, behind a broom in Union Station in Springfield, Illinois, or whatever the train station is there. Say, so how did you go from president to here? White people decided it. <laughs> Say, well, what do the black people think about that? Well, who cares? <laughs> they better try to hold on to that janitor's job they got if they got one. <laughs> You want to do something? I'll find fat Steve. Now, some people have said they've seen some cartoons of my work uh, on the internet that have been presented, and that uh, it, it pretty well embellishes what I have been trying to say in my textbooks. And uh, to the extent that it does that, well, that has been, from what I understand, some people reported to me a plus. Because they didn't understand what I had written very well, but when they saw those cartoons that just repeated what I was saying and attaching my name to it and uh, came right out of the book, the material did, uh, they say that they better understood it. And I can understand that because people are kind of visual, particularly in the year 2021 now, uh, more visual than ever.